Hello and welcome to episode 11 of One Bottle Each. Thank you for tuning in. I'm happy tonight to have my friend Lisa Denning with me. She's known online as the Wine Chef. She's steeped in both wine and food, both as a passion and through her education at both the French Culinary Institute and the Sommelier Society of America. She writes about both of those things for her blog, The Wine Chef, as well as other outlets. Lisa, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, Gabe. How are you, how are you tonight? I'm great. I'm feeling good. Uh, I've had a chance before we chatted to start tasting the wine. So, yeah, I'm doing so, good. So you pre-gamed our Zoom is what you're I saying? I did a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I had to be prepared after all. Understood. <laughs> understood. I took a couple little sips myself this time, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, wine and food obviously are meant for each other, but we don't always all get into them at the same time. Which came you, for you first, uh, the passion for food or the passion for wine? I think it was actually the passion for food. Yeah. So way back when I was working at the New York Times in ad sales and I found my, I didn't know how to cook at all. Uh, and I found myself, especially on Wednesdays when the food section arrived on my desk, you know, I was supposed to look through at the advertising and figure out like who I could pitch to sell more advertising. But I was drawn to all the recipes and the food. And I would start imagining the dishes and how much I would enjoy them. And I'd call my friend back then on the phone. Did you see that recipe? Doesn't that sound great? Meanwhile, I didn't know how to cook at all. So I, within months, I quit my job at the New York Times and enrolled into the uh, six-month full-time program at the French Culinary Institute. And that's where I got my start cooking and learning how to cook. But they also, part of the program was wine, a little bit of wine. And I, I loved wine too. So, so did you, by the end of that, you also have the passion for wine or did that really develop, start there and develop deeply later? Well, I always enjoyed wine and enjoyed drinking about wine. And I kind of, everything I do, I, that I feel like that I enjoy, that I like, I always approach in sort of an intellectual way. So I liked I liked learning about wine. So I'd go to the store and I'd, I'd pick out a wine and then I'd do some research on it. And uh, actually I was recently cleaning out a bag of old papers and I came across a class I took in my twenties that was a wine class. And I hadn't even remembered that. So I guess, you know, even way back when I was doing, starting my cooking, I was also learning and developing more of a passion for wine. So they kind of did go hand in hand. Okay, yeah, wow. So that class that you didn't remember at all and it just had maybe planted some seeds for you that uh, didn't sprout until later. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what happened. So, so 2020 has been a, obviously a, a challenging year and has brought a lot of interesting good and bad things um, to people. It, has it changed your wine drinking habits in any way? Has it, have, you know, have you, I know some people are drinking more, but they're drinking less expensively. Some people are just drinking more. Has any, anything shifted on your end? Well, as you know, I did have COVID and that, um, you know, I didn't drink for the whole time, obviously, when I had a, a, was sick with like a fever. And then as when I started to feel better, I was looking forward to having a glass of wine and, but my palate had, was all messed up back then. So this goes back to March. So I actually didn't really drink much wine for a while there because it didn't taste good. And then eventually it started to taste better and better. And, but I did notice like I drink, I drink less. I know that's unusual for, you know, most people have seem to be drinking more, at least that's what I'm reading and hearing. And at the wine store, people are, you know, seeming to buy a lot of wine. Um, but I'm drinking less, but I'm really savoring every sip. Not that I didn't before, but um, yeah. I'd say I'm drinking a little bit less. I'm writing more about wine though, I guess because you know we're home now. I'm not like you used to be out and about all the time. So I'm home more. So I'm get, writing and researching more about wine. So with all that research that you're doing and writing about wine, you know, with the more time that you have, what is there something particular that's exciting you this year uh, or right now as you're getting into it, whether it's a region, a grape, a trend? 
Well, I think, you know, it's interesting. I started out my career in wine working at Sherry Lehman and there were all the big names, which, and they, uh, you know, like in Burgundy and Bordeaux and California, all the top producers. And so that was great getting to taste all those wines and learn about all the classic regions. Now I've shifted. I work at uh, Grape Collective on the Upper West Side, which is a smaller store and also an online wine magazine. And their focus is more smaller produce, producers, uh, natural, well, not some natural wines, but a lot of organic, biodynamic. So I'm really liking um, delving into you know, those more off the beaten path wineries who are just really, you know, taking great care of the land that they farm. So that's um, rather than the big names, you know, that, but that are also producing delicious wines, but it's like a different approach. Yeah. I, I mean, I completely hear that. I, I've always, um, for me, that that's always been an interest is thing, what, whatever categories of things I'm passionate about, be it wine, be it say music, I'm always looking for the off the beaten path. There's just something about that. that I don't know. I guess it's the undiscovered and the unknown. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's interesting. It's almost like cooking. Like when I went to the French Culinary Institute, it, it, you learn all the basics for cooking, the techniques. And once you have that all down, like I did at Sherry Lehman, I had my basics of all the major, you know, influential wine regions. And that's then you, once you learn all that and you feel comfortable with that, that's when you can take off in food and start like putting together your own crazy combinations or in wine, going to like, Georgia or learning about, you know, uh, orange wines and whatever it is. Yeah. I was in Georgia a little over three years ago. And on that, for me, that was like a, a mind blowing trip. Mm -hmm. and, oh, I'll bet. I'd yeah. love to go there. Just really, uh, have gotten so into, you know, skin contact wines. Yeah. Good ones. Of course, it's like everything else is good and there's bad, but the good yep. ones are just not like anything else. You're right. You're absolutely right. But to go back a couple of sentences to what you were saying also really um, speaks to me. You know, what you're describing is basically as you built up a confidence level in what you learned, it's allowed you to explore, you know, outside of, you know, the uh, to color outside the lines, I guess, so to speak. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that leads us to the first wine, which is the one you picked. So it's a, a, burgundy, a white burgundy. Mm hmm. So uh, what, what led you to pick this wine? And tell me. Well, yeah. Honestly, I ended up picking this wine based on what you had put, picked, what you had chosen. So you chose a, a California Chardonnay and I thought, hmm, what would be interesting to, to have on the same night? And that's when I thought, oh, what about a Chardonnay from Burgundy? And also I thought, let's let me pick one since I already knew what your wine was, I, I said, let's pick one in the same sort of price range and hopefully even the same vintage. So that's what this is. It's a uh, Burgundy uh, Chardonnay from Burgundy. The producer is Domaine Dominique Guillon. Um, and they, this wine is um, about the same price as yours retail, which is about $45. Mm -hmm. And it's a 2018 vintage. And there's a, another very um, wine geeky detail that these wines have in common. I'm not sure if you noticed, but they're both uh, topped in DM corks. Oh, I didn't notice that. Cool. Yeah. Interesting. So, That's very so the wine geeks out there are smiling. The rest of the people are like, well, uh, DM corks are a uh, recomposed uh, cork material. And it, it uh, basically guarantees that there cannot be cork taint. Mm. But it is all natural pork product. I, I like that. I really dig this wine. It's so clean and focused. Yeah. And um, there's um, such a hit of minerality on the finish. And, um, you know, lovely, lovely green fruits. Yeah, I find it's a nice mix of citrus fruits with that great acidity and also stone fruits because you get a certain round quality. You know, I guess that's, you know, typical of Chardonnay. You always get a little bit of a rounder feel, mouthfeel. 
You do. And yeah, um, the citrus is definitely there and the stone fruit, like you said, and they're very, um, it, it's, it's just vi uh, very elegant. And, yeah. and, and those flavors are all there, but um, it, it's also very uh, well put together. And, and the flavors are just really a tapestry where, you know, nothing particular leaps out ahead of the other. It's just all really woven together very nicely. I agree. I'm going to show the label again, because when you showed it, it was so it was glaring. Okay. And I think, OK, you can see it not glaring. Yeah. What's interesting, too, just a little point, this, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with the taste, but typically a Chardonnay from Burgundy will not have the grape written on it. So this one does, which I think is a, is a good decision on their part, because I think it's a little confusing sometimes for your average wine consumer to know. I, I, I completely agree. I, I noticed that um, earlier, uh, you know, when I was taking the bottle out of the refrigerator and um, yeah, I think it's great. I wish more producers would do it. I understand traditionally they don't, uh, right. but I think even if they put it on the back label, which so many resist doing, it would, it would be helpful because there are people who love Chardonnay who are willing to spend 45 or $50 on a bottle of Chardonnay but don't know that white burgundy is Chardonnay. Exactly, exactly. And getting back to what you said, it's the tradition of um, just so maybe some of your listeners might not know this, but in France, they go by the terroir. So they just, it's all about being a burgundy to them versus Americans who think more in terms of grape variety. Absolutely. And that's kind of why I've, I've always thought and sort of advocated to some degree for it being printed on the back label because that seems less an intrusion on the tradition somehow, because yeah. the front label is front facing. Right. Um, but if they pick it up at least and say, oh, Chardonnay, then that, I think that would be helpful to a lot of people and it probably sell some more wine. Exactly. So <laughs> Which is the goal, right? That yeah. was smart of this, this winery and Dominique Guillon. Is this particular winery a, a favorite of yours? Well, I had actually gone to a tasting and um, mostly what impressed me, I don't think I, I'm not sure I really had any of their whites, but I was really impressed with their Pinot Noir. They do a whole, you know, they, um, they were pretty, for, uh, for Burgundy, they're pretty, fairly large producer. I mean, not like one of the big negotiants, but um, they have like 47 hectares, which I think equals like, hundred and something acres that's um, significant. is pretty unusual for burgundy uh, absolutely that's definitely a, sig a very significant size for burgundy yeah um so i remembered them that i that i had really enjoyed their wines great well i i'm, I'm really glad you picked this i'm really like i said really digging it so what would you uh, pair food wise with this wine what does it make you want to go eat once we turn the camera off you know, um, it, I know it's a, it, it, maybe it's so classic that it maybe it's hackneyed, but roast chicken. Oh, really? I would like that. That's interesting. Roast yeah. chicken with roasted potatoes and maybe some Brussels sprouts, just simply mm -hmm. prepared salt, pepper, a little bit of olive oil on, on the on the potatoes and Brussels sprouts. Uh, I, I often think of that for... Um, for Chardonnay and, and for Burgundy. And, you know, how about you? That's true. That's true. I'm thinking more like I would go down more the, the seafood route, some shellfish. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because shellfish tends to be a little richer. So the Chardonnay goes well with that. Um, yeah, I, I think if I went away from the chicken, I would probably go with some uh, soft, stinky cheeses. I was just going to say cheese next. Yeah. Definitely. I don't know if I do stinky, though. I think I do sort of medium, not, not too mild, but not too stinky, because if it was too stinky, I don't know, it might overwhelm yeah, the yeah, medium, flavors in this wine. Medium stinky. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a study. Has anybody done the study? Everybody's talking about how people are drinking more wine during the pandemic, but the consumption of cheese must have gone up as well. I can believe that. I know for me it has. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> So now we're going to get on the, um, the metaphorical airplane and wing our way out to Sonoma County, California. Sounds good. 
Russian River Valley, Gary Farrell. This is a single 2018, uh, as the uh, Burgundy is. Olivet Lane Chardonnay. Gary Farrell uh, is a producer that's um, best known for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. They make a host of other wines, but that's their uh, really their bailiwick is Pinot and Chardonnay. Uh, single vineyard wines, and then they make um, a Russian River uh, sort of cuvee of both Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. But I've, I found over the years that their single vineyard wines are incredibly distinct and uh, I don't know, really interesting, good, good wines. And they've been a producer, I don't know, I've gone to again and again. And I just um, ha had done a single vineyard tasting of their Pinots in the summer. And I was thinking I wanted to taste some of their single vineyard Chardonnay. And so when we were talking about this, it, it, that's kind of how they popped in my head. And it just seemed like a natural um, choice. Hmm. So. I have to admit, this is my first Gary Farrell wine. And I'm impressed. I love it. I think that um, a couple of things they have in common are that they're both, this one is also pretty focused and has a nice minerality. You know, the, uh, I think the fruit's a bit brighter, uh, which isn't surprising, you know, California versus Burgundy, the, the fruit would jump out a little bit more. Right. I mean, even the color, you can tell. It's a much yes. more yeah, absolutely. than the Burgundy, yeah. Yeah, a little bit of that uh, gold in mm. the hue versus that, uh, you know, white, whiter, lighter yellow. Yeah. Yeah, this one definitely, and for me, the, the presence of oak is a little more apparent on this. I mean, it's really well and integrated, but I'm not noticing that really at all on the Burgundy, whereas I am noticing it a little bit, you know, in a good way on the um, California. I agree. It's definitely more apparent. So this is also a $45 wine. Um, the vineyard uh, was planted in 1975 to Wente Clone. And um, this actually is a, we're tasting this before it's released. It'll be out in, uh, in February, uh, okay. specifically for their wine club. So it's, it's not a, it's a pretty small production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really bright. Like the, like acidity is is great on this, I think. But it's it's a good balance with that that nice fruit, California fruit. Yeah, I think that um, the citrus here is particularly more prominent. You, you know, both in the Burgundy, and I think it's one of the more for me one of the more uh, prominent characteristics of this wine. Mm -hmm. Sort of a Meyer lemon. Yeah, Meyer, lemon, lime, sort of all mingled together, definitely. Well, I'll throw back at you what you asked me. Uh, what would you pair with this wine? See, now this one I would have with the roast chicken. Okay. More than the other, because it's just a little weightier and that, that sort of roast chicken to me can, the skin and everything, all that fat, it would just, mm -hmm. they would really meld together well, I think. But the acidity in this would really liven everything up. I agree. Yeah, I love the acid in this wine. I guess it's being, uh, it helps that they're close to the, um, not too far from the ocean, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you get you get that those, those breezes off of the ocean, the maritime influence. Right. Nice. So what would you have to eat with this? Hmm. You know, I, th I think um, I'd go simple as well. I'd probably a, um, a simple roast pork loin. That sounds good. With, with some herbs on it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, maybe herbs de Provence or, you know, or just, you know, crushing up some rosemary and thyme and, and like that and salt and pepper. Yeah. Just very simple. That sounds good. Of, of these two wines... I think that the, uh, the the Burgundy is sort of a bit more further along in its evolution right now. It's it's ready to go, and this one is is certainly delicious and very drinkable. But I think in a couple of months it'll even be you know when it's released even more so. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, this is like a little bit of a 
like bigger wines. So I feel like it can, you know, last for a little longer maybe than the Burgundy. I, yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, the wines that they make, uh, the winemaker is uh, Teresa Heredia. And uh, she's a tremendous winemaker and works with so many single vineyards and really makes, yeah, wines that are ageable. And, you know, I, I've always found them to be well, well balanced wines. That's been my experience with, with what they do. It's kind of what, you know, brings me back to them. How many cases do they produce annually? Do you know, or is it? You no, know, I'm not sure what the total number is, but off the top of my head right now, but I could tell you that those two, the Russian River cuvées of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, are the you know are most of what they produce, and they make you know I think I don't know six, seven, eight single vineyard Pinots and nearly as many single vineyard Chardonnays, and those are all you know, I think in the hundreds of cases, like small productions. Wow. Yeah, well, this one's uh, 603 cases, this particular. Oh, wow, one. that's small, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's one of those things. I think if the, if you love Chard and Pinot and the, the cuvées draw you in and then you want to dig deeper, you move to, you know, to some of these wines. Mm. So do you find, because I know I do, and it's, I don't know, it's something I find myself talking about more and more, as time goes on and the more wine that you drink, do you find yourself chasing acid more and more? Because I know I do. That's funny you say that because I had a customer just yesterday who came in and he was like a newbie wine person who wanted to start learning more, but he literally said he had, had it in his whole life. And he was like 30, I think, at least. He said he had only had a half a glass of wine. So I'm thinking, what should I recommend to this guy? And I thought back on my own evolution and mm -hmm. I definitely started with fruitier, you know, less acidic wines. So that's where we, I started with him. And I did say to him, you'll see like over time, your palate will change. And I compared it to like drinking coffee. Like when I started drinking coffee, I put all cream and sugar in it to, to you know, sort of cover up some of the bitterness. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with wine, like you start out, at least as it happened with me the same way, started out with the fruitier wines. And like you said, now I'm definitely into more um, acidic, uh, you know, a little bit, well, for reds, a little bit lighter and not as heavy. Yeah, same. same. I, you know, while I find I do still like plenty of heavy reds, hmm. I find that it's what I'm eating and the lighter ones I drink. I just drink them more often. Yeah. Yeah. The other, so, yeah. It's the other ones more, uh, you know, it's like I music wise, one of the, you know, years ago, I listened to a lot, a lot of heavy metal and I still listen to heavy metal, but I only listen to a little bit of heavy metal, only a handful of bands. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I feel about these bigger wines. I still like some of them, but in their moment, in their place, I can't necessarily go to them every night. I find myself more with those like, you know, reds like Gamay's or Pinot Noir's uh, that or Furpado or something like that, you know, far, far more often than I would, um, you know, Cabernet, Zin or Petit Syrah. Yeah, I agree. Those wines, you know, the, the big wines, the heavier wines, they're great for like the first few sips. Like nobody could say they doesn't just taste delicious, but to have that throughout the whole night or with your meal doesn't always... It isn't always something you want. No, absolutely. You know, and, you know, it's important to say, I think, too, that it, de it depends how well made and balanced they are. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be hard, even if they're well balanced, if they're very big. But if they're big, but they're balanced with good acidity and you've got food, you've got a chance. Yeah. But if they're out of whack, you're done. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I just get really bored very quickly if they're out of whack. You know, yeah. it's like, okay. Next, you exactly. know, your palate, palate just gets tired and it just, yeah. it goes to sleep. You're right. You're right. Yeah. And it is true that it's, for me at least, um, it's all about like what I'm eating as well. So if I am eating something heavier, I'll, I'll go for that, you know, a little bit heavier wine. But yeah. Not, yeah. But as long, like you said, if, if it's balanced, yeah. That, yeah, balance. That's, that's really the key. Yeah. I, I find, you know, Yes, it's what I'm eating, but what I find I do, you know, normal times, 
when I'm in the office every day and, and driving home, I think to myself, not what do I want to eat tonight? What do I want to drink tonight? And mm -hmm. then we'll adjust what I'm eating so that it goes with what I'd like to drink. Yeah, I do that a lot too. Well, Lisa, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Oh, this was so fun. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. Thank you for accepting. And thank you for uh, choosing the burgundy that you did. I, I, it was interesting to taste um, two Chardonnays. Yeah. So cheers. Cheers to you, Clink. I look forward to uh, to doing this in person, hopefully before too long. Hopefully. Yeah.